Well, this is the second week of our new series entitled Sitting at the Feet of Jesus. I'm very excited to preach this series. I, I, I felt God's hands all over it. There's been so many little connections along the way. I actually, somebody sent me um, a devotional after we lost Matthew on grief, and I started reading that this week, and guess what's in it? You know, the Sermon on the Mount. You know, it's like everywhere I've turned in the last month or so, that's been the case. So I see God's hands all over this series. The purpose of the series is to take some time out of our lives to consider together as a church uh, this vital message that Jesus gave to his disciples and the crowds of people of his day. The partic this particular block of Jesus' teaching is, is literally jam-packed and clearly intended to help us understand what it means to be the blessed and favored and highly favored even chosen people of God. Further, it's also meant to teach us how we should live this out, how we should live out this great privilege that we've been given. And my prayer is that before we're finished, before we're done with this series, many of us are going to be amazed. We're going to be amazed not only at what we learn, we're going to be amazed at what Jesus has done in our hearts as we continue to follow our rabbi, Jesus, wherever he leads us. So please open up your Bibles to chapter 5 of Matthew's Gospel. You're going to wear that track out because we're going to be there for a little while. I've asked Brendan here to, to read our passage this morning. We'll begin reading at verse 1, Matthew 5, verses 1 through 10 from the NIV translation. The scripture will also be available on the screen for your convenience. Now when he saw the crowds... He went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Well, Jesus has just recently chose 12 of his disciples out of this larger group of followers and elevated them to the role of apostles. At this point in his ministry, Jesus has gathered a large following. The crowds of people following him have, have often swelled to a point when he, where he can barely come and go in a town or a village without being mobbed by needy people. Many at this point follow Jesus because he's a healer. They know someone who's been healed or they've heard of Jesus or maybe they're coming for themselves or maybe as the four friends did, they're bringing someone to Jesus that's in need of healing. Others come to hear what Jesus has to say. They've heard from others that he's a prophet, maybe a forerunner of the coming Messiah, but they want to hear him for themselves. And that's, I think, an application point for us. These people, these crowds of people, they came to Jesus because others told them about him. They told him about his, how he healed them. They told, him about, they told people how he straightened out their lives. They told people about the things that he said and said, you got to hear this guy. you got to come and listen to him. He's awesome. This is amazing. Sometimes we're timid about that, aren't we? So the crowds come to hear this new rabbi, and they're not disappointed. Matthew tells us they're actually amazed at his teaching. They're amazed not only by the content of his teaching, but they're amazed that Jesus speaks of his own authority. In other words, he doesn't teach as the local Pharisees did, relying upon past rabbis and sages before them. Instead, Jesus' message is unique, unusual, and highly practical. 
That was something they weren't used to. He reinterprets the law. He applies scriptures in ways that they had never heard before. His teaching touches the people where they live and forces them to consider righteousness and intimacy with God on an entirely new plane. That's not to suggest, however, that everyone bought into Jesus' yoke of instruction, right? As we might expect, many found his teaching interesting, but we're often intrigued by new ideas and new ways, aren't we? And things were no different in the first century. Many in the crowd that day would eventually find the application of Jesus' teaching far more challenging than they were willing to bear. Sadly, it's no different today. And of course, the religious leaders consider this new teaching heresy. Jesus' claim to have authority outside of the ruling class and the Sanhedrin's approval was at the epicenter of a developing rift that would eventually fuel their hatred enough to call for Jesus' crucifixion. But the crowds and the masses from Galilee, they felt entirely different about Jesus. He's a homeboy. They had long ago realized they meant little to the Jewish hierarchy made up of well-to-do and well-connected families from Judah in the south. And so when Jesus begins his message with, blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are those who mourn, it got this crowd's attention. For they understood Jesus was identifying with their poverty. They knew that he understood their desperation and their unhappiness. They knew that he identified with how difficult things were under Roman occupation, and they knew that he had compassion for them. And they understood their longing. He understood their longing for a, a better way of life that God had promised his people. And they weren't wrong to long for these things. They weren't wrong. They weren't wrong to look to God to meet their needs. They just lacked the greater understanding of God's timing and minimized the iron grip sin had over their lives and over the entire world in which they lived in. Like many today, they lacked an appreciation for the damage that sin has wreaked over all of God's creation. And they lacked an appreciation for its power and influence in the world and what it would take for Jesus to overcome it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says. Notice he begins by affirming the, the great value of his people. The kingdom, he says, belongs to those who follow him. Despite your present circumstance, as difficult as they may be, and many of us have many difficult circumstances that we're bearing under right now, you're blessed, you're fortunate, and you're highly favored. You have great value before your heavenly Father. You're precious to him even, precious enough that he has adopted you as his child, and he's prepared a kingdom just for you. Precious enough that he sent his one and only begotten son into this world to give us life so that we might be saved. We talked about that just a few minutes ago. How important is that? How great is that alone? If he never did anything else for any of us, how great is that alone? That he would send his son into this world and Jesus would give us life so that we might be saved so that death would no longer hold its grip over any of us. For God so loved the world. We hear that. We have tremendous value and worth before God. And this is true today, as much as it was for the people of Jesus' day that gathered on that mount. No wonder the crowds swelled around Jesus. No wonder crowds of people followed him wherever he went and hung on every word. To a people considered worthless and treated as such, Jesus' message was like a breath of fresh air. Truly, his words were, as we sang earlier, hope for the hopeless and rest for the weary. Jesus acknowledged the people's struggles, and he had compassion for their cries and their tears. To a marginalized and voiceless people, his message of the kingdom was extremely attractive. And yet, as attractive as it was, Jesus' teaching was also difficult for people to grasp. See, Jesus taught on multiple levels simultaneously. He weaved parable and hyperbole, symbolism and illustration in new and masterful ways. He taught profound spiritual wisdom that required obedience and action. 
but always, always in the context of a loving intimacy with the Father. His teaching required then, as it does now, time and effort and heart to reflect deeply upon the spiritual principles that he lays out. A mere scratch of the surface is going to miss his entire point. Jesus begins by suggesting we are bankrupt spiritually and have less than nothing to offer God of our own. Blessed or fortunate are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But how can poverty of the spirit be a good thing? It doesn't sound good. It runs contrary to everything I think we naturally think, right? To us, spiritual poverty seems bad, not good. But if we listen closely to the words of Jesus, we will soon discover that what he teaches is often opposite of what we naturally think and feel. Opposite of how we naturally operate to the point that we begin to feel like everything in the kingdom, it's like it's upside down. And that is precisely the point of much of this message on the mount. Compared to our natural inclinations, it is. It is all upside down. We're upside down, and Jesus is trying to get us, get us right. The first beatitude, then, is meant to focus our attention on our brokenness and our spiritual poverty before God. Isaiah commented on this some 800 years earlier, saying, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Now, it's hard for us to hear that, isn't it? That's an ugly statement. Feels like a slap in the face, doesn't it? And yet, it's only by accepting this ugly reality that we can find the greater reality, which is God. We have to start at the very, very, very bottom to grasp this. And as long as we resist this first fundamental truth, because our pride won't, won't allow it in, we're going to also resist much of what Jesus came to teach us. We're going to miss all of that. At the core of the Sermon on the Mount, then, is our need for righteousness. We'll talk about this in the coming weeks more, but the main point Jesus is driving at in the Sermon on the Mount is what he mentions outright in Matthew 5.20. Namely, that if we are to enter into the kingdom of God, our righteousness, it must surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees. Now, to the people of the day, the Pharisees were like, oh my goodness, that's holy of holy people. But Jesus doesn't look at that outside covering. It has to be more than surface trapping and tradition. It has to be more than ritual and duty. It must be about a transformation of our heart and our character, our motives, and even our thought life. Jesus actually asks quite a bit of us. It will no doubt take effort. It will take effort to bring our lives into alignment with the teachings of Jesus, and yet it can never be attained through works of our own. Well, so how can that be? That's a little confusing, isn't it? Seems, again, like a contradiction. Our works are like filthy rags before God, and our spiritual poverty uh, means we have nothing to offer, yet at the same time, it takes great effort to live in obedience to Jesus and to live out His kingdom mandate. How are we to understand this tension? Dallas Willard, a wise and mature Christian teacher, once offered a helpful suggestion when he said this, grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. I think that's helpful, right? Let me say it again. Grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. We can't earn God's favor. You know why? Because we already have it by grace. We already have. You can't earn something you already have. You can't earn a gift. We're already blessed and highly favored. Not because we've done anything to deserve it, because none of us have, but simply because it's God's nature to love. It's His nature to give of Himself in this way. We're blessed all the more in this life as we, as we realize our spiritual poverty. The less we try to do in this, the less we try to put our stuff in the mix, the more we'll find the blessings of Christ. Let's try to understand this, then, the first beatitude this way. Blessed are the fortunate, uh, blessed are the fortunate uh, and highly favored are those that realize their spiritual poverty, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who realize their spiritual poverty. So what's the first step in entering the kingdom? 
It's realizing and then accepting our powerlessness and depravity before God so that we may receive His grace and mercy in Jesus. So the first step, again, it's realizing, but also accepting. It's not enough to just acknowledge it, accept it in our hearts, that, we, that our personal powerlessness and depravity before God, so that we can receive all that God wants us to receive of Jesus' grace and mercy. Anything else, folks, is sin, rebellion, and false pride that we're called to repent of. These are the things we're called to repent of. And this goes to the core of the first beatitude. It's about understanding our depth of brokenness that's much deeper than we ever imagined or cared to admit. It's about our grasping how spiritually limited we actually are. It's about grasping how unrighteous our thoughts and our motives and our deeds are. It's about grasping how little we have to offer God and then how much, how desperately much we need Jesus. So let's try understanding it this way. Blessed are those who not only realize but also accept their spiritual poverty, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Fortunate are those who have enough humility to understand their brokenness before God. In a world where pride and self-centered achievement mean everything, the, this attitude of true humility, it stands in stark contrast to the world we live in. But for the Christian, A.W. Tozer notes, humility is absolutely indispensable. Without it, there can be no self-knowledge, no repentance, no faith, and no salvation. In a later verse, similar to Matthew 5.20, Jesus will connect humility directly to salvation in the same way he connects righteousness. Placing a little child, his, his, when his disciples are all arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, Jesus takes a little child and he puts it right in the midst of their arguing. And Jesus tells them, unless you turn or repent and humble yourself like a child, like this child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Having humility then, is an essential component, essential part of the blessing of the first beatitude. Without it, we remain blind to what Jesus is teaching us, and we forfeit, very possibly forfeit, the blessing of the kingdom and all that it contains. According to scholar and writer William Barclay, there are two Greek words that we normally see used for poor. The first is the word penis. Penis describes someone who meets uh, his and his family needs uh, through the work of their own hands. Today, we would interpret this word to simply mean people like us who work for a living. According to the definition then, at least in the Greek mindset of the first century, most of us would be considered poor. I imagine a few of us don't like to think of ourselves as poor. But as costs rise, inflation rises, and the middle class continues to shrink away, I'm telling you, we're certainly moving more and more towards the reality of our working for our daily bread. But penis is not the word used here. It's patakos. Patakos is a word used to describe absolute or abject poverty. Its root is found in the Greek word patosin, which means to crouch or cower. So it was used to describe a type of poverty that literally forced people to cower before others and beg from them in order to survive. So when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, this is the word that, that, is, that is there. Now bear in mind, Jesus spoke in Aramaic. And that Hebrew and Aramaic share certain characteristics. We talked about that last week. And that Jesus was speaking from a Jewish mindset. So it's helpful then to look at how the Jews of Jesus' day understood the concept of poverty. According to Barclay, as time went by, the concept of being poor underwent a four-stage process in the Hebrew community. It began by meaning simply someone who's poor, then went on to mean someone who's poor because they have no influence or prestige in the community. See, even then it was about who you knew, right? Eventually, it came to mean downtrodden and oppressed. By the time Jesus spoke this beatitude on the mount for the crowds, the word had come to mean those who lacked any resources whatsoever and were forced to rely upon God for their daily provision. 
In other words, they needed a daily miracle in order to survive. Their dependence was solely on God for everything. So in the end, poor and poor in spirit become somewhat synonymous, don't they? For those who trust God for everything because they have nowhere else to go, nowhere else to turn. Spiritually speaking, this is Jesus' point. So when Jesus says fortunate or blessed or highly favored are those who have nowhere else to go except to the living God for daily sustenance, he turns this devastating handicap into a huge kingdom blessing. Throughout Scripture, we see God not only demonstrated mercy and generosity to the poor and downtrodden, he commended those who do, did likewise. And at times, he even commanded Israel to do the same. In fact, God chastised the spiritual leadership and the elite of Israel for turning their backs on the orphans and the widows and neglecting the cause of the poor many times. The first beatitude alone, then, should cause us to think deeply about our relationship to money and the security that we derive from our wealth. Unlike Greek society, very, very few of us would meet the criteria of Israel's poor, Rather, we would likely meet the criteria of the rich who depended on our wealth for security. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should liquidate our bank accounts or retirement accounts or do anything like that, no, no, nor am I suggesting that God sees poverty as a blessed thing. The blessing God offered is, o, o Testament Israel was contingent upon their willingness, however, to care for the poor. So in the context of community, God expected his favor and his blessing to extend to the widows and the orphans and the poor of Israel, as well as the impoverished foreigners among them. That was the purpose of the restrictions, if you remember, on gleaning to the edge of the fields, for instance. The landowners were to leave something for the poor and the widows and the orphans to gather for themselves. Poverty and worse, the social conditions that often develop as a result, they're not the blessing Jesus had in mind. Rather, it was the freeing of the human soul from material idolatry to make way for total dependence upon the Father. That's the prize that Jesus was offering. That's the blessing that he was giving. Unlike much of the prosperity preaching of today, we don't hear Jesus saying, blessed are the rich and well off. We don't hear him say that. Because this marks a huge change between Old Testament and New Testament theology in, in, when it comes to blessing, God's blessing. And this is likely because Jesus teaches these very things can become stumbling blocks to prevent us from dependence and devotion to God at this incredible level. As he will later say, you cannot serve both God and money, suggesting that money is the master. It's not our servant, it's our master not the other way around. By the end of the first beatitude, it's not really, uh, it's, but it's not really about money at all, right? It's about seeing ourselves in a state of spiritual patakos, or utter spiritual poverty, and having nothing but filthy rags to offer God. Yet how often have you heard someone say, I, I, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm a pretty good person. How often have you heard that? I had a brief conversation with someone last week. He literally told me how proud he was of maintaining his high moral standard. That's what most people will think. They don't usually say that, but he, he put it right out there. It was not the right time and place to challenge that assumption, but he said that he, would, he wanted to talk more about that at another point. And so, of course, I'll be looking for that uh, window of opportunity, and by grace I'll be able to help him understand that that's not what it's all about. But this attitude, as you know, is very common and prevalent in New England and among Catholics and ex-Catholics in particular. Yet what Jesus is suggesting here is a complete reversal to that, complete reversal. I'm not really a good person. I'm not. For instance, Jesus later suggests in chapter 7 that we're evil, saying, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more then will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? But, the, but, the, but right up front he says, if, the, if you then, who are evil, now again, this is not meant to insult us, though I guess it, it may feel that way. Jesus was using exaggeration 
or hyperbole, which was common, it was a common rabbinical method in the first century to get the listener's attention. The idea is this, compared to the holiness of God, our righteous deeds are as evil. The idea is similar to me lighting a match in the noonday sun compared to the light of the sun. The light of the match is nothing. That's the idea. Isaiah was using the same approach when he compared our righteousness to filthy rags. We may not like the style. It's a bit in your face. But it does get our attention, doesn't it, right? We, we listen when we hear these things. All of this, though, is to help us see God's blessing and favor comes to those who see themselves as powerless over their sin and in need of God's forgiveness and mercy in Jesus. For, for, to help us see we don't have anything to offer. We need to be humble and able to receive in order to uh, discover the blessings of God. The full blessing and favor of God comes to those who see themselves as spiritually bankrupt before him. Those who see God as the remover of their sin and their shame, even the lifter of our heads. That is why people who have suffered greatly from consequences of their sin often have an advantage over others who have never been to that place of shame and moral degradation. Though there's always an opportunity for the reemergence of the ego, for the most part, people who have experienced a deep surrender and shame and God's saving grace in the midst of that tend to struggle less with this idea of spiritual bankruptcy than those who, who never have had that experience. As Tim Keller suggests, the irony of the gospel is that the only way to be worthy of it is to admit that you're completely unworthy of it. All right? The only way to be worthy is to admit that you're completely unworthy. Perhaps as we close here, you're, you're feeling a bit beat up. I'm sorry if that's the case. Jesus' words and teaching can sting a bit. At times, they can be downright painful. And that's why last week's message was so vital for you to grasp. It's vital to grasp that we belong to Jesus and that he has declared us to be his. We belong to him. We're indeed blessed, fortunate, and highly favored. The importance of grasping this goes beyond emotional comfort. It's vital to grasp because it will determine how you'll hear everything that Jesus teaches. This is the filter that it must come through that you are blessed and highly favored. If I hear Jesus telling me a hard truth, but then I know he loves me, and is telling me this because I need to hear it for my own good, I can receive it then as loving discipline. Because I know that God disciplines those he loves. He disciplines those he blesses and favors. I know Jesus doesn't say these things to hurt me or to upset me, but to help me. To help me gain the spiritual blessings that he teaches all the more. And if I need a correction, I'm good with getting it from Jesus. He's kind and gentle. Because I know that he loves me. And he has my, my best interest at heart. So please don't interpret the things Jesus teaches as, as somehow putting you down, as put-downs. Jesus would never do that. But he's willing to offend your sensibilities for sure, whenever necessary, and even say things to shock you in order to get your attention. But he always does it out of love for us and because he knows these things are, are matters of life and death, not only for us, but for, for people around us. This is important stuff. So if Jesus says something that offends you, know that he does so because he loves you, and you need to hear it. You need to hear it for some reason. Remember also there's always an upside with Jesus, and this is true in each of the Beatitudes. Though we may continue to wrestle with what it means to be poor in spirit, the blessing is found in the kingdom of heaven already belongs to us. There's always an upside with Jesus. So in closing, now, preachers say that all the time, don't they? But then they go on for another half an hour. I've just got 25 more points, right? But I'm, I'm actually going to land the plane here. So in closing, let me leave you with a Tim Keller quote that former interim pastor Dwight Dean, the famous Dwight Dean, who has left us for Maine, <laughs> left in my office. 
I wonder if he was trying to tell me something. It was like this, it was over in the window. It was, you know, it's a great saying. Helpful, I think, to sum up much of what we've talked about this morning. It goes like this. The gospel says you are more sinful and flawed than you ever dared believe, but more accepted and loved than you ever dared hope. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for these wonderful words, for your spirit in the middle of it. And we're looking forward, Lord, to kind of getting over the, the rough spot here and and trusting that if you tell us a hard thing, that it's for our own good. Lord, and as we continue on uh, down the road in this sermon, Lord, that uh, we're going to take our time and go through so we can understand well, we're praying that you'll change our hearts and our lives through it. Lord, we're, we're reaching out to you for this blessing. Uh, we're, not, we're not claiming things and, and wanting things of the world. We're willing to look for the things of God, the heavenly treasures that, that will change our hearts, change us to be more like Jesus. We honor you, we love you, and we just thank you that you uh, love us and are concerned for us in this way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.